sexuality when I was like 10 and I kind of on some level always um but as like a very little kid I um I I never even knew what gay was like I didn't know what gay was until I was like eight or nine so, uh, cause I grew up in uh, in Ecuador, um, it, for like uh, three, four years, and then I moved here, and I never really found out, cause they don't teach it in school, um, and you just I never knew. Um, how I found out was, um, I kind of just like saw pride flags like in D.C., and I kind of figured out what it was from that, and, um. Then, like, when I first even started questioning, I still only knew the label gay. I didn't know any other labels. I only knew about gay. And so I tried to kind of figure it out. And eventually, like, uh, the day before I, uh, I came out to all my friends, I was on a FaceTime with one of my friends, and she told me that she was pansexual. And so when I was on the call, uh, I just... I kind of uh, started noticing that it was probably time for me to, uh, to say it too because um, it was just, uh, I kind of found out from that phone call. And then the next day when I came out to my friends, one of my other friends was like, oh, I, I'm gay too. And so like a big part of it is when you're young, you can still know that you're gay. Like it doesn't really matter your age. Yeah. And I also have this other friend who knew he was transgender uh, when he was four years old. So you Absolutely. can really know at any age. Thank you. And thank you for being here. I, I'm thinking of when I was 12 years old and I was hating myself and wondering how I would survive the next day. So I'm just so thrilled that you are here and living your full existence. So I wanted to ask a question of your parents, if that's okay. Um, and we'll start with um, Carrie. So Carrie, um, what do you want your, your child to know in terms of them being here and sharing experiences with mostly adults? Yeah, I just, I want um, Sophia to know how proud we are of her and how brave, she's just such a brave, bad, brave badass. <laughs> um, and we, we want her to know that no matter what, um, we always have her back. And she does know that, um, but I want her to know that, um, you know, every minute of every day. And as, a, as her mother, um, you know, people have asked me uh, as she's, Kind of come out to other family members and things that they've asked me what are you worried as a mother and i say i'm not worried i'm not worried for sophia one single bit i do worry about other people's reactions and what i want for her is to be accepted for who she is because she's amazing um and that's what she deserves yeah thank you carrie um serena um what do you want hope to know about her being so badass, as um, Carrie just mentioned, and being here with all of these adults that are listening to them share their experience. I gotta try to compose myself a little bit because I get a little teary hearing uh, Hope and Sophia talking. Um, I want Hope and Sophia to know that what they're doing today and what they're doing is revolutionary work. It is. They're modeling to others how to be brave in accepting and loving who they are. And that's a model to me as a parent. To if my 16 year old kid and if my friend's 12 year old daughter can accept and love who they are, we all need to work on loving and accepting who we are. And um, there's, I have a favorite quote that I wrote down because I, I wanted to read it today to Hope and Sophia and to everyone. And it might be familiar to you, Dr. Medina. If you're going to actively dismantle, oh, if you are going to be actively dismantling systemic oppression, get comfortable with the fact that you're going to be a villain in some stories. 
There are going to be people who aren't going to love them and who aren't going to accept them, but that doesn't mean anything about who they are and what they're doing because every day their mere existence changes the way the world works. At Hope School, things are changing because of hope and how hope reminds the teachers and the students that their pronouns are they and them. That is incredible. Hope did a presentation at their school in their uh, one of their classes about uh, what it means to be transgender and fielded questions and even had some rough moments. Hope has been called names in school and it, it amazes me how Hope every single day has the bravery to get up and keep fighting because Hope deserves the same kind of world as everybody else. And so I want them to know and I want Sophia to know how proud of them I am and how grateful I am to be in their presence today. Thank you, Serena. And Hope and Sophia, I don't know if you're reading the comments in the chat, but people are in love with you, not in a weird way. Um, they are totally giving you props for everything that you are doing. Um, and Tan um, is a colleague and friend of mine, and he's actually mentioning um, that there are teachers out there who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, you definitely are not alone. It's just that for some of us that are a little bit more seasoned, not old, because I'm not old, I'm seasoned. Um, it was hard to actually be teachers who were um, overtly queer. And so for all of the failed opportunities, um, we apologize, but um, we, we did the best that we could in the times that we could. Um, Carrie and, and Serena kind of already started talking about this. Um, I'll go to Hope now. Um, Hope, I know that I personally, as a queer child, um, had to overcome a lot of obstacles. Um, your parents have already started to mention some of those. What are some additional obstacles that you've had to encounter in school, if you feel comfortable sharing um, any of those? Yeah, that, that's okay. Um, like I said before, you know, um, teachers not using correct pronouns, not having any representation, you know, blatantly incorrect facts. And, um, you know, there have, there's been many an occasion where people have called me homophobic slurs. Um, I, I've been called uh, a faggot before, uh, a lot more, but there have been a lot of instances of um, people calling me slurs. Well, and you, yeah. th thank you for sharing that. Hope you actually have a follow-up question. One of the participants, Dr. Cardona is asking, so when that happens, when you have these attacks and slurs, um, how do you address it? I mean, because you're, you're, you're the student um, and sometimes these aggressions are coming from the adults in the school building. How do you tackle that? Like, I can't even imagine. I mean, this year, since COVID has happened, I haven't really had many instances, but before that, I didn't really do anything because I knew that my administration probably wouldn't, wouldn't do anything. I mean, luckily, there was a big change and there's new um, administration and they're a lot, a lot better. Um, but before, I usually just, you know, I'd say to the person, you know, I'd probably yell at the person, but there wasn't anything I could do because especially one time when I was in weight training, um, which is a, a really male dominated class at my school, um, specifically male athletes and the, um, the atmosphere at my, at my school, especially the athletes, they can be very, very homophobic, misogynistic. Um, I mean, I'm not a girl, but, you know, people in the class that are people perceive as female, you know, they can be not great to them. And when I would correct people on my pronouns, I would be called a faggot and the teacher um, wouldn't do anything. He'd just pretend like he didn't hear it, even though I know he did. It was things like that. Because for a while I thought, oh, well, maybe he he didn't hear it, but some, you know, he would be in earshot or sometimes he would make faces, but he would never say anything. And yeah. Hope, in, in, in hearing you speak and, and you're so eloquent about the things that are happening and that aren't happening, do you feel like if um, there were um, 
texts and representation and the teachers were including um, some of this work uh, as part of what happens in the classroom that things might be different. Yeah, maybe. Um, because we need to normalize LGBTQ people, you know, if you see them more in media out of just Pride Month, you know, you see them everywhere. They're, they're seen as normal, you know, elementary school books, as my mom said, um, reading, seeing it in books, you know, it being talked about as normal, then people might start seeing it as normal and then that will lead to less homophobia. Awesome. Um, are you ready, Miss Sophia? Your turn. Sophia, as comfortable as you feel, um, what are some of the things that have made it tough for you um, as you navigate the classroom in, in schools? I mean, for me personally, um, I'm kind of the kid who kind of bla blazed a trail in my school for other kids to feel comfortable to come out. It was less about like the homophobia. There was at one point this one girl who um, would call me and my two other friends. Like this was like a, a, like about a month or two after uh, the three of us had uh, come out. Uh, she would call us the F slur on this group chat. And um, um, uh, like most of the kids on the group chat were all uh, allies. So they all also got mad at her. And so later, um, three months later, I got a text from her apologizing and saying that um she uh, that she is things completely different now and I didn't really believe it at the moment but I FaceTimed her a couple of times after that and like we kind of talked it out after a little while we're not friends but there's no problems between us anymore so awesome thank you for sharing that I have a follow-up question for you Sophia and, and I'll, I'll ask this question of hope in just a moment you have here um about 40, 50 educators in this space. And um, one thing that I forgot to mention is that not only is this going on YouTube, but um, I, my publishing company has actually set me up with um, a publicist. And so we will be talking about this YouTube video on Univision and NBC and ABC and things of that sort. So what would you tell the teachers in this space? You have them here hostage um, in the best of ways. What would you tell them? What do you need them to know? Um, I feel like uh, you should just try to make school a place where kids feel um, at, like, uh, if their home isn't a place where they're being like um, very supported, you should make a school their home where they feel supported where they can uh, uh, talk to people and where they feel like they can be themselves. Like have a, a, like, have like a club or something or so, uh, something to make the kids feel supported, anything really. Would it make, I know that there's a lot of literature that's coming out around um, teachers sharing their pronouns and having safe space posters or safe space stickers or pride flags in their class. Um, for the teachers here, does that make a difference for you? That definitely makes a difference. My friend, like, uh, I wasn't there for the first day of in-person school, and my friend sent me, like, a picture of uh, one of the posters that our teachers had in our classroom, and it definitely makes a difference, yes. Awesome. And um, another difference is also having, like, books and stuff. I personally, there's one comic that I really like to read called Heartstopper, and um, that definitely makes a difference to have like those books and all of that. I've never heard of that one, Heartstopper. Yeah, it's really good. It's my. I favorite. mean, it sounds good. It sounds good. And I know that teachers are also sharing some books. We're gonna share some resources at the end. Please feel free to do that as well. Um, Hope, I'm about to ask you the same question. One of the participants was also saying for teachers, even saying like um, families or dads or moms rather than singular um, to make sure that they're inclusive, that would be it. Or instead of boys and girls, um, y'all or students um, definitely is, is one of the ways to go. So Hope, you have these teachers here, including some principals, and I believe at least two college professors. What is it that you would tell these um, educators in the space? What do you need for them to do? 
tell them what to do, Hope, because they'll listen. They know that my abuelita's watching. So I would say, um, like you mentioned before, with the safe space posters, don't use them unless it is an actual safe space. For example, at my school, um, some of the teachers will put them up because um, cause it's, you know, it's seen like, oh, okay, it's better because then people think it's accepted in the classroom, uh, especially the principal. He was very much like, okay, you have to be LGBTQ inclusive, but if you're not, if if you're not, don't put the posters up because as LGBTQ students, we want to feel safe going to um, places that say safe space, but if they're not a safe space, like I said, don't put it up. Also pronoun pins, things like that can normalize for trans people um, who use different pins or who use different pronouns, sorry. <laughs> um, just, you know, maybe talking about LGBTQ people, normalizing it. Yeah, and I don't know if you just realized what you did hope, but basically you told all of the administrators and the teachers in the space to stop being fakes and not perform, that if you're gonna do the work, it can't be just during Pride Month and it can't be just because you're trying to be woke. Like you actually have to do the work and the research to be able to provide these safe spaces. I mean, that's what I heard hope. I was like, all right. Um, that's, that's I think what, what you were saying, that, that's the message that I took. So I was like, I'm gonna work real hard hope so that I'm not a fake, so that I'm not a fake. Um, let's go to Carrie. Carrie, um, the parent question that I had for the two of you is, um, we have educators, you all are educators, you're also um, parents. What advice would you give um, educators on behalf of your own children and children that are part of the LGBTQ plus community? Well, I think it's very much of what Hope said is that, you know, we need to normalize, um, you know, these people and elevate the LGBT, LGBTQ plus community um, in real ways, not fake ways, not just during the month of June. And I think as an educator myself, um, uh, and you know, I teach kindergarten, um, and that's where we start the younger, the better. Right. And so I remember the first time, um, about eight years ago that I read a book, um, in my Spanish class of Nico tiene dos papas. Um, it's a beautiful Chilean story. And, um, and one, and I did a thematic unit on family and different types of families. And, uh, when I said like, you know, they're, uh, those that tienen dos papas. And one of the kids in my class said, yo tengo dos papas. And immediately it normalized the class for him. And I, it never left me. And, and I've consistently taught it, you know, um, in all, all the time on all my years. And, and just, um, these are people's children too, right? And so the more we normalize it, the more they feel safe and accepted. And that's what I expect of educators. And that's what I expect of myself, because like what you said, I think this topic um, scares the crap out of people more than any, maybe any other topic, honestly. Carrie, let me go ahead and mute everyone. And then you will be able to finish your answer um, so that we won't hear the echo. There we go. Adelante, Carrie, you were finishing your statement. Sorry about oh, that. That's okay. I just said that, um, you know, I think the more we normalize it and, re and remind ourselves that we are talking about people's children, uh, we expect that of our of teachers and we expect that of ourselves. And, um, you know, like going back to what you said is I think that teaching uh, about um, LGBTQ families, it, it does scare the crap out of educators, maybe more than most other topics, but we, ha we have to do it. We owe it to our kids. Yeah, thank you. Said in that same question, but I'm gonna add one of the questions. People are sending me questions also directly. You can send it to me directly or you can send it um, in the chat box for everyone to see. So the same question, what do you, what would you say to the parents? But also as an educator, um, there's a question about some languages being very gendered, um, Hebrew, Spanish. Um, what, what do we do in terms of that as well? Because I know that you've done some work in that area. 
I'm, I, I'm so glad that you brought it up because I, I made notes so I would feel prepared if I got too nervous. And that was one of the things that I was going to mention. So um, the first thing that I, when I was thinking about this is educate yourself. We can't expect our children to educate us. I am so grateful and so thankful for hope and the education that they have helped me get and, and every day the things that they teach me. But it is not just Hope's responsibility to educate me. It's my responsibility for my child, the children that I teach, the teachers that I work with, uh, the administration that I work with, so that I can share what I know and what I'm learning and realize I don't know all the things. I have so many things still to learn and I'm gonna make lots of mistakes. So I need to be open to that. And if I make a mistake and I use the incorrect pronoun, it's okay to say, whoops, sorry, use the correct pronoun and move on, that's okay. Um, I think also it's important to practice the pronouns. Practice, 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 because it may not come naturally to us. And I've had so many people argue, why, why they and them? That sounds like plural. Well, you know what? It's great. It, that might sound like plural and it, that's fine, but it's still an expectation that you're going to use that pronoun because that's what my child or other people's children um, have decided fits how they feel about themselves. It's not my place to dictate or, de or decide or determine. Um, I, I love what Carrie said. Imagine if this were your kid. Would you want someone to, how would you want someone to treat your kid? right? And all those children that are in my class or in the classes of the teachers that I work with, those are like their children. By the end of the year, they feel like they're their children. It's a huge loss when they leave the classroom and go to someone else. So remember that it's really important to think about how those children feel and what they need. So the, the part about the gender in language. So what the first thing I want to say is I really would like people to get over the that the RAE doesn't accept that. That the RAE says that, you know, it's supposed to be feminine or masculine. This is the way you say it, or that's the way you say it. The other day I was in a, a discussion with someone on Facebook about it. And I said, did you realize that abogada, doctora, enfermero, just 30 years ago were not correct terms and they were not used by the RAE just 30 years ago? Guess what? The raye might be behind times. It might take them time to catch up. We don't have time to wait for the raye. Raye, Real Academia Española, for people who may not know what it is, is we don't have time for that. We have kids now. We have people now who deserve representation. So the raye doesn't say that. You want to be stuck in old fashioned thinking? That's that person's business. But I think the rest of us need to embrace that there needs to be. Uh, language that is representative of people that we have in front of us and people that we have around us. So there's a, there's a language that's gendered. We can create non-gendered language. The other day we were in a classroom and we were talking about ellas, ella. We talked about um, ay que bonite. So we were practicing the language and the kids were even asking, what is that? And we had a discussion about it. And you know what? These were first graders, six and seven-year-olds. They have no problem question. They're just like, oh, okay. There's some people that have a that have a um, a gender uh, like female, a gender like male, and then there are people who don't identify with a gender that are non-binary. The kids were like, oh, okay. So yeah. we we need to be as open and and loving as our as little kids are. Thank you. And You're just welcome. so you know, there are tons of articles actually available that are um, that are readily available and they're pretty good. Um, in Spanish, particularly, there's a lot about the ella and the le. Um, I, I'm having trouble because my mind is so binary in Spanish. So I'm working on that as well in terms of les amigues or les amiguis or um, les maestres. Instead of saying bienvenidos, bienvenidas, bienvenides, um, instead of saying todos, all this. And so those are the things that, that we're working on. Um, I'm going to go back to hope for this next question. This next question, um, two-parter, um, because I want to make sure that we get to these questions. Social media is obviously very different now. Um, we didn't have that. Some of us didn't have that when we were young. And so what role does social media play in terms of your existence and your experience as a queer youth? And then also, might you be willing to share um, in terms of your family and how 
um, that has impacted um, the way in which you see yourself and the world? Uh, so with social media, I'm okay with answering both, <laughs> but with social media, they're definitely good and bad things. Like I've learned so much from social media and the internet that I probably wouldn't have learned without it. You know, in school, I don't have access to these things, but with the internet and social media, I do. I mean, there are definitely some bad things like queer baiting, for example, which is when a straight person pretends to be um, queer or does things that are considered, you know, gay um, to, you know, entice the LGBTQ community to follow them, but they do it without actually being LGBTQ or supporting them, which is not good <laughs> um, because, you know, if you want, as a queer person, I want representation from actual LGBTQ people, not just straight people pretending to. Um, and rainbow capitalism is also a really big problem when it comes to social media. You know, brands, you know, putting, slapping rainbows on everything and calling it a day for Pride Month when the rest of the year they do nothing and, you know, they don't advocate for us. They don't really care unless it's Pride Month. Then they're like, okay, it's good to be gay. And then the rest of the month or the rest of the year, nothing, which is not okay, you know? If you're going to support us, um, then sure, you can have rainbow stuff, but then at the same time, you don't just get to capitalize off of us and then do nothing. Um, I love that, Hope. Can I add something to that? Because your parents know this. Um, we always share with folks that if you're not actively dismantling the systems that oppress, in this case, the systems that oppress our LGBTQ plus youth, then you are the oppressor yourself. And so I love that you're bringing that into the conversation. And what about family hope? Because I know that we also have family members here that would love to hear about the dynamics that have played out in your home and, and with your family. Yeah, when I came out as bisexual, um, I'm not bisexual anymore. I identify as queer. But when I did, um, it was, I remember this because my mom loves telling the story. But, you know, I was at breakfast and I told her and she was like, okay, can you pass the syrup? And that was it, you know, it was just a normal thing, which is amazing. Um, and, you know, uh, over the years, they've been great. You know, they, I've been to, um, a couple of prides. My parents, you know, are amazing. They buy me um, rainbow stuff. The only thing, you know, when I came out as trans, they were a little bit iffy on it because I don't think they were completely educated. Um, like they don't, they didn't understand it um, a whole lot. They're a lot better now, you know, like with pronouns and stuff. Just e even still now, things like binders um, freak them out. Um, but it's because, you know, they don't, they don't understand and they're still, they're still learning. I love my parents, um, but they are, they're not learning as fast as, you know, as I want them to, but they're trying, Would which you, is better than some people's parents. <laughs> absolutely. Would you share, cause you mentioned the word binder and I know that perhaps some of the educators in the space, um, need some clarification on that. Gotcha. So, um, I'm transgender, which I said before, well, I mean, I'm transgender. I'm also non-binary, but for me, I get a lot of dysphoria because of my chest. So a binder is, it's a thing that, um, it compresses your chest to make it look flatter to alleviate dysphoria. Thank you so much. And thank you for being so just fully transparent. Um, Cause I saw some folks faces like, what is that? Um, so thank you. Thank you for educating all of us and sharing information with all of us. Sophia, the same questions. Um, what are you dealing with in terms of social media? And also might you share if you feel comfortable um, a little bit of the family experience with um, Carrie and your dad and your siblings and your extended family as well. Um, with social media, personally, um, I uh, like I scroll through TikTok uh, like ninety percent of my day, 
is spent just going through TikTok. And so, uh, and I see like a lot of uh, just like uh, gay people, just like, uh, uh, you know, like w with their pride flags, just like saying, I'm here, I'm queer and I'm proud. So uh, I feel like social media is a great way of doing it. I just think uh, another thing is like, you have to be, uh, you have to have very tough skin to be able to do that because if you're gonna uh, uh, show yourself on social media, there is gonna be people who will like uh, be like saying bad things about you, but also know that on the other side of the screen, there's also an entire community right there. Love it, love it. Y tu familia, Sofia? Que onda con tu familia? Um, my family was actually pretty great about it. Um, I came out to my grandparents only a little bit, a while ago. Like uh, my dad did it for me, but um, after that, my grandma FaceTimed me and she actually said, like, I thought I would have like a, some very bad backlash, but it was actually all positive. Um, she said that uh, uh, she loves me and that our family is always someone I can talk to and she's always there for me in uh, terms of anything and me being who I am. And I feel like also um, the person who gave me probably the best reaction or at least my favorite uh, was when I came out to my oldest brother and his reaction was just, uh, oh yeah, you don't like boys. because. <laughs> <laughs> And I just started laughing when he said that. So I feel like I've had a pretty good experience with this. Awesome. So um, I have one last question and then we'll have a little bit of time um, for questions from the participants. If they have any, please uh, begin. You've been sharing them, but you can share some more in the chat box or directly to me. Before I ask um, Hope and Sophia the last question, I wanted to ask um, Serena and Carrie um, just, any brief words for parents and families who are navigating these conversations? Because um, I know that when I told my, my dad, Jose Luis, um, he was devastated because he grew up in this very machista, Latine, Latinx family. Um, my brother, Gilberto, he's three years younger than I, than I am. He actually uh, punched the, the brick um, around our garage um, because he couldn't believe that his older brother was gay. Like um, our two guests, I'm blessed that my family has fully embraced um, myself and my husband, but I know that that's not the case for all. So Serena, briefly a statement, what would you share with families that have to do this, that have to navigate these waters? So you don't have to get it. It's not your story to get, it's their life to get, right? It's, it's theirs and you just, you have to love them and be willing to navigate the waters with them. And it might take a while or it might come like that, but love is ultimately the most important thing. And no matter what, I love my kid. So remember it's their story and not your story and you gotta love them. You gave me chills, Serena. I've never heard anyone express it like that. Um, Carrie. Oh, I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna parents, cry too. <laughs> the parents um, in the space. Yeah, so uh, recently, you know, Sophia has had a, a pretty positive experience by coming out to those around her so far. Um, and I feel that I've shielded her a little bit um, from some of family members that are, are likely not to be so. Uh, accepting. And recently I told my mother who is um, struggling a lot with it. And um, I got some kind of pretty predictable responses. Like she might need counseling that, um, you know, things like that, that were upsetting. And I didn't want to put Sophia through that. And basically what I told her was, well, first of all, I didn't freak out. I didn't get mad she said what she said. And I said, you know, that's, that's not work I can do for you, mom. <laughs> that's work you have to do for your, on your own. And I'm just telling you, because this is who Sof Sophia is. And I'm asking you to accept and love her because she's my daughter and she, she deserves to be who she is. And that, what, what can, what can she say with that? You know? And, and so at the end, my mom said, I love her. 
and that's where we are at this moment. Um, so thank yeah. you for that. Thank you. Thank you to the parents as well. Thank you to Carrie and Serena for being so transparent as well. Um, I know that there are other um, LGBTQ youth out there, Hope and Sophia, that are going to be watching this YouTube video. Um, I know that like you and some of the folks that are in this space that are commenting, we had um, some huge obstacles that we had to overcome and no one should have to wait a lifetime to begin to love themselves, which is what many of us um, had to do. So you're here and you have this opportunity. What would you tell other queer youth um, if they were listening to you today, what your what would your message to them be, knowing that classrooms aren't always safe spaces? And um, let's start with Sophia this time. Sophia, what would you tell um, other queer youth that are listening to or watching this YouTube video once it gets posted? Um, I would just tell them to be themselves. Uh, like a big part of it is just like, uh, like if you're like a boy and you want to wear a dress, just wear the dress. Like, uh, personally, like I hate wearing dresses. So I always wear like a dress shirt instead of wearing a dress whenever I go out to like a fancy dinner or something. So like, just be you, it doesn't matter. Like at the end of the day, like it, it's, it's such a, sm a small life that we live. Like it, you don't just waste it not being you. I mean, how old are these guests? I am like in awe, in awe. So um, Hope, I have that same question for you, but um, might you be willing to answer also one of the questions that has been posed? Um, if you're comfortable, how do we deal with the religious narrative? And then if you would close us out by sharing your message to other queer youth um, as well. Yeah, so with the religious narrative, I watched a couple of videos on it, and the um, the religious part, you know, um, LGBTQ, like, a, a man can't lie with another man, that was um, a mistranslation, and it was added to the Bible in the 19, I want to say about the 70s, so it wasn't an original part of the Bible. Um, it was a man shall not lie with another boy. Now, at the same time, the Bible is a really, really old book. It was for like 400 years, you know, it was passed by voice and then it was edited and retranslated. It's basically the oldest game of telephone. And, you know, I, um, I personally have my own thoughts about religion, but you can say to them, um, like, you are allowed to believe what you want to believe. Um, and your religion, it's your religion, but at the same time, it may not be mine. And if your religion says gay people um, shouldn't exist, you can say, okay, well, that's your religion, but I exist and I'm not going to change myself for you. The fact is the Bible says a lot of, a lot of things. It said things like um, uh, you can't cut, think, like you can't cut your hair, you can't eat meat, you can't get tattoos or piercings. Um, you know, if you have premarital sex, you'll get stoned to death. There are a lot of things. And it was a book written so long ago, you know? You yeah. can believe whatever you want, but don't put your hateful views onto other people. Gracias, gracias. So what would you tell me? What would you tell me, Hope, if I was still a, a young kid dealing with it? Because I so needed both you and Sophia. Um, I think several of us um, in this session needed you and Sophia um, when we were young. Yeah, I would say be safe until you can get out of the environment, if you're in a bad environment, until you can get out of it, be safe. I don't want you to have to hide who you are, but if you're not safe, then it is important that you wait until you are safe to be yourself. I mean, I obviously believe that you should be yourself, but also be safe, you know? I think 
you're doing amazing and you're doing a great job and it's okay to not have everything figured out right now. I don't have anything figured out. Most people don't, but that's okay because you will, you will figure things out. When I was a lot younger, I never thought somebody would love me, you know, in a relationship type of way. And now I'm in a really, really happy relationship. Um, you know, there's, there's just, there's a huge community of us and we love and support and care about you. There's millions of this and be safe and, you know, try and be as happy as you can. Cause like Sophia said, we're only here for a short amount of time. So why not be happy while you're here? Thank you so much. I mean, come on. Um, I wanted to share a couple of resources as we take a look at any additional questions that you have. Some of you have asked for books and I know that we have been sharing them. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen because I did want to share a couple of resources. I know we have some bilingual teachers in this space. These are some of the bilingual elementary school books that you would be able to use. These are some of my favorite. They call me Mix, Me Llaman Maestre is um, really to um, address non-binary uh, folks. And it's a great resource that's in English and Spanish. I love Cuando Amamos Cantamos, when we love someone, we sing to them. It's a love story really between a, a son and a father. And I really had not seen representation specifically for queer Latinx, Spanglish speaking youth. And so I made it my mission to make sure that I had a publishing company that would allow me to do that. And so if you're looking for something in English with Spanglish, uh, focusing on the queer experience, you have Boys Don't Cry. And if you're looking for something in Spanish with Spanglish, um, obviously that's the story of um, yours truly, um, someone who never had the privilege to be straight acting. Um, I wanted to recommend specifically these organizations. So obviously Glad, Glisten, and Trevor, the Trevor Project are really, really great. Um, but I also have learned so much from one of my friends and um, colleagues, a fellow educator, Ace. Um, and so if you are on Instagram, please follow at Teaching Outside the Binary, just one of the most beautiful human beings who um, shares so much in terms of resources. Um, they have compiled um, book lists at the elementary, middle school, and high school levels um, that are on their um, Instagram stories saved so that you could actually utilize them and immediately go to Amazon and start purchasing them or wherever you purchase books if you don't support Amazon. Um, but teaching outside the binary, I just cannot tell you enough about ACE. Um, just wonderful, wonderful human being. Let me take a look at some of the questions. I saw some additional comments. Um, do, 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 do. La mira es muy corta. Actually, it's just love, Sophia and Hope. Just tons and tons of tons of love. This is your exit ticket out. Um, please post it on social media or um, in the chat box. But in order to advocate for LGBTQ plus youth um, and families, what are you gonna do? Put it out there, say it out loud, write it so that my grandmother can see it from up in heaven. And that way, if you say it and then you don't do it, she'll come and visit you. So make sure that you use your exit ticket out. Um, in order to advocate for LGBTQ plus um, students and families, I will. Um, thank you so much, Sophia. Thank you so much, Hope. Thanks, thank you so much, Carrie and Serena, for sharing your hearts and your stories with us. Know that we are in your debt. And I just am so, so, so proud to have shared this space with you all and check out the video. I will have it posted this weekend. Um, thank you to somebody who said, Jose, you have to press the record. I'm such a duh, duh. Um, I missed the first like five minutes, no worries. Just like the first five minutes. I'll promote it when I do all my little interviews, don't worry. So we caught everything but the first five minutes. So yes, pride was a riot. It was a riot. And for all of the LGBTQ youth, don't, don't 
forget that there were folks out there fighting so that we could have the rights that we have today. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy, enjoy. Hope and Sofia, especially in Spanish, I say abrazos, abrazos, abrazos. Gracias, gracias por todo. Gracias por compartir sus corazones. That means gracias por compartir sus corazones. Adios, everybody. I know Sven. Adios, Jose. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Adios. I'm, Adios. Reading, I'm reading your exit tickets. Make sure that you put one because if not, funny will come, y'all. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Serena. I'm going to purchase books that are inclusive. I'm going to read more inclusive stories. Uh, I will make my classroom a safe space. I'm going to amp up my library. Silvira Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson. Thank you. So sad I missed it. I live in Central. Don't worry, Stephanie. Uh, I had a lot of people um, contact me telling me that they were in, um, still in, 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 at work. And so we will post this. Um, I will share what I learned today. Gracias, gracias. I will advocate for LGBTQ plus youth and families showcasing stories. Abrazos a todes. Abrazos a todes. Uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you, uh, Stefan, for being with us all the way from London. We appreciate you joining us. Visiting a lot of schools, advocating for LGBTQ plus students. I'm going to save these and then I'll send them to um, to you and uh, to Karina, uh, Karina, to Carrie and Serena. I combined your names, um, Carrie and Serena, so that you could share them with Sophia and Hope. Would that work? That would be great. Uh, adios, everybody. Ahí nos vemos. Adios. Thank you a todos. Thank you a todos. Adios, adios.